Right, what's happening, people? And welcome back to the Joey Knight podcast. Welcome again to my friend Joel Bayer. Joel, how's it going, mate? I'm all right. Are we ever going to name this show? We're going to keep letting them go through it. Like, keep going through it. Keep going through it. We've had we'll, a couple in. We appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, we'll just keep it going. And once we decide yeah. what one we like, we're going to stick with it. Listen, crisis is a word that I think is banded about a lot in football. And yeah. you, can, you can call something a crisis. It's been a couple of weeks. It's really not. Mm. But if there are two clubs that are sort of borderline edging on crisis at the minute in this Premier League season, two big clubs, I'd say it's Chelsea and Man United, isn't it, really? I can't believe it. Like after you 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 drew again, well, we drew against you, and mm. it, it almost felt like a win, but then at the same time, a loss as well. I just thought, oh my gosh, this is a statement, you know? Mm. And then to go and lose 2-0 to Brentford, I just thought, what is going on here? It's you mad, know? yeah. I mean, uh, look, like, a lot of the expectation going into that game was that we were going to go into that game, we were going to put Brentford to the sword and we were going to really, really cement ourselves as going, okay, we've turned a corner now and we're on a good run. Agreed. The problem is with Chelsea, I've said it time in, time out now, there is a very, very clear blueprint on how to beat us. And until we get someone that can put chances away and especially chances away early on, I think it's going to carry on. Because if you sit deep, if you're organised... If you're composed and you've got enough nerve about you to be able to go, we'll let you do what you want, but we're going to try and catch you on the counter-attack. If you do that, at best, you'll come away with a win. And at worst, a lot of the time, you'll probably come away with a point. Mm -hmm. So I think when the teams lower down in the table, lower than us in 11... The Nottingham Forest, uh, all those kind of teams. Exactly. They're the ones that we're going to really struggle against. And it's ironic because at the moment, and this is sort of relevant to this discussion, when Man United are going into a match with a top six side, even a, even an Aston Villa or Brighton, I really don't fancy them. When Chelsea go into those matches, I'm a lot more confident than I would be as a Man United fan. However, when Man United go into matches against the likes of Wolves, Nottingham Forest, maybe Sheffield United, teams they don't play well against, they've got the match winners that get them over the line. And Chelsea just haven't got that at the moment. So what we want to discuss today is who is in the bigger crisis out of Chelsea and Man United. Well, just to go back to your last point, yeah, I'm starting to question if they've got those match winners, mm. if I'm honest with you. And we're going to look at stats shortly, but it's not looking good. But no. go on, you, you roll it out. Well, do you know what? I think the best and fairest way for me to approach this, because we all know my club Chelsea got a lot of love for them and I have inevitably always got a little bit of blue tinted glasses on. So I think the fairest way is why not I give you a few of the pros for Man United. Right. So we on. start off with Man United. Obviously, when I look at Man United, they're a huge club, a lot of history, lots more history than Chelsea over the over the course of even our lifetime, I would suppose. But, you know, running back years and years and years. And in terms of globally, their fan base, you'd think it's they're, hard to they're, rival they're, it. They're the biggest, like, whether we like it or not. I know we don't, don't tell anyone, you know, but yeah, they, they are. And I think the lure of being the manager, the player, even the owner, for example, mm. that comes in and changes Man United and restores them and propels them to the top of English football is probably a bigger lure than maybe it would be at Chelsea. The problem we've got there is the ownership and we will come on to that but again with Man United ever so slightly and I do mean by the thinnest of margins they've got a manager that is more proven in English football I would say and I, what I mean by that is silverware because Mauricio Pochettino has never won anything he's had he's had second place finishes he, 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 he won league uh, at PSG in English football, I'm on about. Oh, sorry about so, that. I was so, so, I, I was so quick to... Well, no, yeah, I would completely agree with yeah. you. I, I, I'm saying this. I'm trying to play devil's advocate here. Yeah. Of course, Poch is a better manager and a more proven manager. But what I'm saying is, in English football, Ten Hag has that one league up to his name. And Mauricio Pochettino, as of yet, doesn't have any. And what I would say is, although he's got a lot more impressive league finishes than uh, Ten Hag, Pochettino's had a lot more chances and a lot more cracks of the whip to be able to sort of get silverware in England. So that's another thing you could have going from. And again, another thing I would say, a going for Man United is if you look at the point we just made there about match winners. Now, you might argue that they don't have match winners. But what I would say is at the minute, I do think that the likes of Marcus Rashford and Bruno Fernandes, whether they're having a slight dip in form at the moment, are more proven to be able to go and get you Premier League goals than a lot of the players that Chelsea have in that lineup at the Over second. a long yeah. period of time, yes. Yeah. I think I'm looking at the short term and the stats. Hoyland, X amount of minutes, zero goals, zero assists in the Premier League. Garnacho, 
the least amount of minutes out, out of the attackers, minus Jaden Sancho, mm. zero goals, zero assists. Rashford, the most amount of minutes, one goal, one assist. Yeah. Outscored by and Nicholas team. Jackson. You know, and he's had and he's had his fair share of a chance to score way more goals than he has done so already. Mm. So that's my stance when it comes to that. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not here trying to like put down Man United or whatever. I'm just here to be honest. Mm. That's my job. Honest Joe. Uh, on this show anyway. But um, no, I just think, do you want to keep going through or do you want my opinion? That's pretty much all I've got from Man United, you know? Um, I think, yeah, you you did mention the bigger club aspect. I think that is, that is huge. I think, um, you know, financially, obviously you guys are obviously good financially but I think they're do you reckon they're less in the problematic stage of uh, the um, the fair play um, financial fair financial play well I'll tell, tell you this right regardless of your stance on selling off academy products and I think anyone that knows and watches my channel will know my stance on this I'm not a fan of it mm. I think that selling off the DNA of our club sometimes can be necessary to a small extent I see some players go and I think you know what we couldn't help it but a lot of the time, you know, it will come back to, to sort of bite you in the behind. But Man United haven't really got any sellable assets. Mm. Like when you look at it and you really deep it, like they haven't got many, have they? Because no. they don't want to sell a Marcus Rashford, right? And, they, and, and, and then when you look at it, okay, who have they got that's come through the academy that they're going to be able to sell? Unfortunately, Mason Greenwood would have been one of them and may still be mm. one of them after his loan spell at Getafe. But... When you look at Chelsea's, just over the last couple of years, you look at the players we sold. Kurt Zuma, Tomori, um, Nathan Aki, obviously we, we had Ta brought him Tammy in and Abraham. sold him on. Tammy Abraham. The list is so... Mason Mount. Yeah. yeah, Tomori, Mason Mount. I could go on for ages. And the ones that are even going at the moment, when you look at the likes of Lewis Hall, oh. who will go on a permanent to Newcastle at the end of this season... Um, we have got an abundance of talent in that academy that I think keeps us afloat when it comes to FFP. Um, and also, you know, when you talk about dead wood within a club, Man United, and I'm not labelling this player as it, but Man United got rid of the likes of Fred this season. Uh, there'll be a couple of others. But in terms of dead wood within a club or or players we would perceive as being Deadwood, Man United have got a hell of a lot more than that than Chelsea. And I think they'll struggle to get fees for those players. No, 100%. I agree. I mean, I look and I can name you players in e every position where you go, mm, don't really know about that. Mm. You know, the, the the right back situation for me is really interesting because I think Dalot's improved a lot. You know, he really has. He might be one that they sell for more money that they, they got him for. Mm. I don't know what they got him for, but, you know, I'm sure he's improved. So I'll say that. I think Bruno Fernandes could still command a high fee. Um, Marcus Rashford would. And obviously currently Hoyland because he's, fresh mm. you know I think outside of that I, I don't see Mason Mount if he was to ever go to go for more than 60 mil you know like mm. everything you're saying like I think you're 100% correct Anthony are you really going to get more than 90 mil for him mm. Jaden Sancho are you really going to get more than 80 90 mil for him you know Varane you're not going to get more money than what you paid for him Casemiro mm. you know Amrabat's obviously that's a loan but so you're 100% right like likes of Luke Shaw, all these value, like literally on paper, on the contract, when it comes to like sponsorships, yeah, it looks strong. But in reality, it is poor, man. Like Martinez, never fit. Mm. Can't sell someone like that on for a lot of money. Not saying that they're going to sell all of these players on, but we're just looking at them individually and going, who would you be able to get money for? So if they don't sell them, because there's always that point of like, maybe we don't want to sell our players. Yeah. Maybe we're building something for the future here. Brilliant. Okay, five years time. Who's a playing again? Do you see what I mean? You you'll be l m maybe a Martinez, a Nana, maybe yeah. A Nana, Martinez, Anana, Martinez, Rashford, and possibly Hoyland. Rashford, Hoyland, Mason Mount. Five years time. Yeah, it'd be about thirty-two, something like that. Thirty-one. Think, yeah. yeah. Maybe. Maybe. So, so you look at Chelsea's team, Garnacho, five years time, as well. straight away. Yeah. yeah, I mean, straight away, just from the first eleven, and and let's let's bear in mind there when we spoke about that, we only mentioned three first team starters, mm. okay? Because mm. Garnacho and Mason Mount aren't starting matches. So when you look at Chelsea's first eleven, five years time, okay, Sanchez will be thirty in goal, sort of prime age for a goalkeeper. That's fine. Reese James, if we can get over the injury problems, will be at his peak. Benoit Badia-Shield or Axel de Sassi, 
will also both be around the 29 mark sort of coming towards their peak and then you have got an absolute powerhouse in Levi Colwell there again at his peak now the left back position if we keep hold of him we got Ian Matson there Crew Correa won't be old by that point Ben Chilwell maybe might start to move on so there you have one you look at the midfield three Caicedo Enzo Gallagher I'm not saying everyone's going to stay and yeah, retain saying, this spot yeah, age, age profile wise could. all there mm. then we go along the front line who's dropping out Raheem Sterling maybe but you, haven't, you, that, you haven't even included in Cuckoo. Yeah. You know? So this is what I'm saying. When you look at the age profile of the players that Chelsea have got on it, it leads me on nicely to looking at Chelsea's pros. Everyone. They're, they're ridiculous. Like, ridiculous. Like, and you know we're naming so many players here Nicholas that Jackson. ultimately not every single player here mm. is going to be able to play for us. But I tell you one thing, they can all command transfer fees going forward. Mm. So I think that when we, when we speak about that FFP point, mm. I think that Chelsea... I don't, I, want, I don't want to say Chelsea are in the better of it because Man United, we always know, have got the fact that they're Man United going in their favour. Mm -hmm. You know, merchandise, you, you see the, the uh, shirt sales that they'll make that around the world, all the sponsorships and everything. So that's always going to go in their favour. But then I think the key thing to look at here is the ownership. And at the moment, you will probably search far and wide to hear people talking positively about Chelsea's ownership. Um, and, and that could all change overnight. But I think one ownership and one sort of theme and path we're going down that is very unlikely to change is the Glazers at Man United, isn't it? I mean, if we look at the potential introduction of uh, Sir Jim Ratcliffe, you know, he's he's it's only a percentage. Mm. You know, the Glazers are still there. And um, I don't even think that the, the Man United fans really want Sir Jim. If I'm honest with you, like they, they might I think they would if it was a, if it was a full takeover, wouldn't they? They, they would rather him more than the Glazers, mm. but it's not ex it's not 100 percent what they wanted. They wanted Qatar. Mm. Let's be real. Uh, but it doesn't let it doesn't look like that's going to happen. Um, like what we said, the Glazers they look like they're not really going anywhere. And I, I just think 100 percent. You're right when you when you look at you see at least with Todd. He's mad, but you can tell that his intentions are to actually better the club. 100%. You know, like he's, yes, it's a different format than it is in the States and he's still getting to grips with it. You know, you'll see him on Twitter, you'll see him on, you know, all this kind of stuff. But he generally wants to make the club better. Mm. And I think that's a start. Mm. Do you know what I mean? He's listening to fans. He's talking to fans. He's doing this. Jesus ain't talking to anyone. They don't care. No. You know? So I think... I think when you look at it that way and you look at what you just, th th that fantastic point about the FFP, right? The players, the sell-on sell -on clauses and stuff, the sell-on amount of value you can get with them. There's no there's no question to me who are in a better position at the mm. moment. Going forward, will that still be the case? Yeah, because United ain't won the league for like, what, 10 years now? Rio was involved the last time they won the league, mm. man. And I said to them, a few of the fans, I said, be careful, you could go 10 years. They used to laugh at Arsenal fans going, oh, you haven't won the league for 10 years, mm. whatever. I said, listen, that number comes around really quickly and another one can come around yeah. really, really quickly Liverpool fans well. will tell you that. Come on, man, you know? And then you look at, and because if you look at, the, if you look at, look, you'll have, you got City, they're going to be in good hands, maybe even after Pep goes because of the way they've structured the club. Chelsea always find a way to come back. Mm. Newcastle are now in the mix. Liverpool have a good structure. You know, they've got something that works. Hopefully, I don't know what that'll be like once Klopp goes, mm. but it's still there. Arsenal have found their feet, you know. <sighs> Who else we got in there? You've got the likes of Aston Villa coming up now. Aston Brighton never Villa. look like they're going anywhere. Brighton as well, because they look like they'll just type in a new manager on the computer and get, mm. and get someone that fits the bill. So mm. it's not easy, man. I think United... Yeah. It's funny you mentioned Rio there. He must be looking at Johnny Evans playing for Man United at the minute and thinking if Johnny Evans can still do it, I probably could still do it at that level. <laughs> Throwback. I think respectively, knowing Rio, he'll probably say my back's not good enough. Yeah. Uh, but in his mind, he probably thinks if my back was good enough, I could definitely play. So we spoke about FFP there. This is another key, key point. The first thing that everyone will label at Chelsea is the length of contracts and these players. And what if it doesn't work out? And I completely understand that, you know. So Chelsea's wage bill should obviously be a lot higher than Man United, shouldn't it? Overbloated squad, you know, all these players on... I would think so. No. Chelsea's wage bill is about 30% lower no. than Man United's. Where and are we, you getting um, this information um, uh, uh, um, from? And um, we talk about this, dark web. <laughs> yeah. uh, we talk about this, right, in terms of like the thing that everyone will throw is the eight-year contracts. And what if it doesn't work out? And I do completely understand that. However... 
when you look at when these contracts end for these certain players, say, for example, an Enzo Fernandez, he's going to be at the back end of his 20s when they end. Uh, the same with Mikhailo Mudrik. A lot of these players that are getting these longer contracts mm -hmm. are going to be coming towards the late 20s and they're still going to probably have one more sale in them. Mm. Also, in terms of when a player moves to demand the most transfer fee, you don't move them right at the end of their contract because that's not when you're going to get the money from anyway. So when there's an eight-year contract, what you've got to look at it, in my opinion, is if they're going to sell him, it's going to be around the five to six-year mark, yeah? Anything after that, and you probably just hold on to him because you're not going to get the same sort of value for money. But if we look at the five-year contract, for example, they gave Mason Mount, yeah, right? Yeah. And let's say, okay... Young player Weeble in, not specifically in place of Mason Mount, although I did think a lot of Mason Mount's best work was on the left wing. Mikhailo Mudrik, we gave him an eight-year contract. Yeah. At the end of the eight years, if he stays on the contract now and doesn't get a pay rise, and if Mason Mount does that, Mikhailo Mudrik has been paid less in wages than Mason Mount has at the end of his five-year contract at so Man United. What is he, so what is he on right now, roughly? Roughly, I know you're not going to know. I think he's on business. around the hundred and... 60 mark okay yeah chelsea's wage bill is pretty low mate like it is pretty low well, lukaku is low right at the top to of it yeah 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 of course not in the grand scheme of things but lukaku's right at the top of it obviously uh i don't know whether some of the wages are being paid there by roma yeah. um and then enzo fernandez is pretty high on it and obviously raheem sterling was one before they had the restructuring Got of you. the wage bill yeah. but then when you look at it like a lot of the stars that we've bought in you'd be very surprised like and there might be things in their deals where they speak about okay if we if hit you win causes, or if you hit yeah, whatever. But I, I think what's appealing is that if you're any human being and you go to work, anyone here watching, if someone says to you, right, I'm going to give you 100 grand for eight years instead of 100 grand or 150 for three, four years, you're probably going to take the 100 grand for eight years if you've got your head screwed on because you'll go, man, I can, I can like chill a little bit more. And don't forget, these guys are pay getting paid weekly. Do you see what I mean? Mm. Like, all right, they'll probably get it in a monthly check, but we're talking about salary weekly here. Mm. So it, it's it's so much more lucrative for a player to do that. And but I just never, I never did the math. Yeah, thinking that Mount would be getting paid more than Mudrich after both their contracts are done. When I thought flex was coming for me, I had to sit and do the math. Oh, you did the homework, yeah? <laughs> I did the homework there. You can that, catch, that uh, conversation. Catch you and uh, catch you and uh, flex on the take on. That's it. Later yeah. on today on five. Yeah. Um, we look at one more thing, and when we speak about ownership, this is very, very key, right? <sighs> We saw, obviously, the video, I think it was last season, of the roof at Old Trafford leaking. Um, and we hear murmurs that maybe, especially from the man himself, one of the GOATs, if not the GOAT, Cristiano Ronaldo, he spoke about the staff still being the, st uh, the same as when he left before. Now, listen, there's nothing wrong with having longevity and jobs. One of the things that Todd Bowley's come under immense amount of criticism for is the massive overhaul of staff. But the point that I think Ronaldo was trying to make there was there was a lack of progression in the actual facilities in the club. Um, and obviously, Carrington, you know, there, there's been little change there since Ronaldo was there before. Old Trafford, obviously, we're seeing little change there. Company that actually, uh, a, a business that gave me tickets for tonight's game against Blackburn, Jet Set Hospitality, very, very good. They um, often put up their behind the scenes type things. And I was a little bit underwhelmed sometimes when I've seen the Old Trafford sort of behind the scenes hospitality area in comparison to some of the Chelsea ones. Because I think, God, I would think Old Trafford's would be a lot, lot better. So one of the main things I look at here is like, it's no secret that Chelsea have acquired land next to Stamford Bridge. They've also, a little bit more under the radar, unless you're a Chelsea fan, acquired a fair bit of land around Cobham, our training ground as well. Mm -hmm. So they're looking to expand the training ground and make it a state-of-the-art facility. Okay. They're looking to expand the ground and... Whatever reasoning you can give this, when we speak about the owners, okay, they want the club to be better. Some people are saying, yeah, but why do they want to be want it to be better? Because they want to be able to take more money out of it. I'm not even going to sit there and, and question that that might eventually be a factor. But we know in the first five years, they can't. That was in the contract of Roman Abramovich. Whoever he sold it to was not able to take money from the club for five years anyway. Wow. So when we're going on about where are each club going to be in five years, I think Chelsea are going to have a better ground, better facilities at the, tra uh, the training ground. And with Man United... If, say, Sir Jim Ratcliffe comes in and, and, and pulls some strings, it could well happen. If the Qatari takeover sort of came back out of nowhere, then brilliant, they'd be in the driving seat over us. But I think you've got to go with what is in your hand rather than the uncertainty of what could potentially happen. 100%, I think you're spot on. And do you know what's crazy? I didn't know that about Chelsea's training ground, and I've been there many a times, right? Cobham is already a really nice place. Mm. So it's not like... 
you know, you, you're fixing like something that's proper broken. You're like, oh no, like it's it's one of the most impressive training grounds in the whole country. Mm. So that's incredible that they're going to improve it even more. But that's what big that's what big clubs do, bro. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like even if there's there's something there that's already good, they take it to the next level. That's what United were on back in the day. That's why their academy used to be the best in the world. And you know, believe it or not, it really was. So that's why you had that class of '92. Or if you looked at the England squad, it was Man United, Man United. But they, a lot of players would go from you know came from the Man United academy or played for Man United in general. Mm. So, uh, but I think they've definitely taken their, their, their foot off that. Uh, obviously, you guys you guys commanded that for a while mm. in the, would you say, mid-2000s? I mean, yeah. Yeah, and, and yeah. probably afterwards as well. Like, I know so many uh, like academy players and stuff like that. Do you see Man United's academy? That's another one. Do you see Man United's academy being better than yours anytime soon? I think it's hypothetical because to look into the future isn't mm. something we're able to do. But if I try and predict the future by looking into the past, no chance. Absolutely no chance. Like, okay, you, you might be able to educate me here. Let's go Marcus Rashford, okay? Scott McTominay, you know? Yeah. Garnacho. Um, Mason, 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 yeah, Mason Greenwood, um, Greenwood. Just, just despite obviously the troubles he's had and what's mm. gone on with him, very good player. Mm -hmm. um, I'm now... A little bit stumped. Is Dean Henderson I mean, an academy product? Co Kobe Mayno, he's a okay. potential. Uh, okay. Obviously, he's injured, and we won't know how good he is till he comes when he comes back. And Neil Lango is he an academy product? <laughs> Sorry, mate. That's all right. Um, yeah, you can tell the sniffles are going around. Yeah, yeah um, he was. Elango was. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, then from there, I mean, the uh, the furthest back I went was probably Marcus Rashford. Came on the scene. God, about. Eight years ago 2018. Now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so about seven years ago or something like that now. Yeah. So if I go back the last seven years, you could go Mason Mount. You could go Reese James. You could go Conor Gallagher. You could go Tamori, Gahey, Zuma. Uh, <laughs> the, the Do you think it's fair, though? Because obviously there was a situation as to why they came through. With the transfer ban? Yeah. Do you see what I mean? It's a bit skewed, isn't it? Because if United went through the same thing at the time, we would be saying the same thing about them. They would have had loads of academy players go, come through as well. Didn't we finish above them in the table that year? I'm not saying that. I'm talking about the players <laughs> coming through the academy. Yeah. You did. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> do you see uh, what I mean? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think there is that 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 sort of side of it. But then again, when, when we say it's unfair, you know, someone might be able to prove me wrong because this could be the season, the transfer ban, where they finish maybe second. I'm, I've got a feeling it wasn't. But if we did finish above them in the table that year, um, and obviously, look, the following year went on to win a, a Champions League trophy, so that they're very unlikely to win now this season, then you could argue that, OK, we were forced into it, but it did still happen. And even before we were forced into it, we were still developing these players. There was uh, oh a yeah. time in our most successful period where we really weren't. We really weren't like you were That's looking true. at the likes of Jose uh, time, uh, yeah, uh, Lewis Baker, um, Josh McEachern, players like that, mm. which obviously won't stand out as being well beaters. But more recently, we are bringing these players through the academy, and it looks like time in, time out, we're bringing more ones in. So I do think that our academy levels out there. Here's the main thing, right? How long can Chelsea go without Champions League football? Because realistically, it's very unlikely now, barring a significant change in almost the club's sort of or the team's DNA at the moment as a team in terms of being able to get over the line. Yeah, we play well against the big teams, but ultimately, more often than not, you're not playing the big six, you're playing the rest mm -hmm. of the teams in the table. How long can Chelsea afford to go without Champions League football until this sort of balances it out and maybe propels Man United ahead of us in this, you know, or behind us in who's in less of a crisis because at the moment Man United have Champions League football uh, despite what's going on in the table at the moment I wouldn't back against them getting European football over the course of a 38 game season um, not saying I think it would happen but I wouldn't back against them because they do seem to get results over the line now at the moment if Chelsea don't get European football this season even when you look at the the ability to lure maybe a Victor Osman an Ivan Tony, if there are other clubs in Champions League that want them they're probably more likely to go to them, aren't they? Yeah. So that's one thing that I think Man United could have over us, no? 100%. If you're asking me, I would say, um, I don't think they're going to make Champions League this year. I'm starting to wonder if they'll make Europe this year, mm. if I'm honest with you. I don't think they'll make Champions League, but I, I think there's that chance that they could get There's a chance that they'll Europa. get Europa. Uh, and again, it, it's so tough. We discussed this last week on the show when we were ranking like who's going to finish above who. Uh, but yeah, you're right. I mean, that badge, man, it always does something to attract players. And I think maybe you're awesome and no, but uh, 
Ivan Tony, yes. Mm. Do you see what I mean? Like, I can see Ivan Tony if he gets a chance to play for Man United to go mm. over Chelsea. Yeah, who knows? Mm. You know, again, it depends on who's playing in Europe. Um, but like, yeah, I don't. I generally look at Man United's position right now, and I just think if you give Manchester United the two, three years of an opportunity to, and you're not in, and you're not in Europe, you could find yourself in a sticky situation because. I t I've seen it with Arsenal. I've seen things turn around really quickly for football clubs. Um, if you look at Arsenal, when Arsenal Wenger left, we were all over the gaff and then we had bad times with Unai Emery. Next thing you know, Arteta comes in. Yes, the first couple of years weren't great, but once a club gets into the swing of things and they f they they find that guy that's right for them, things can change very quickly. Mm -hmm. You saw this when Liverpool got Klopp. You know, like, yes, they got to the UEFA for the UEFA Europa League final in his first year but besides yep. that they were just they were still building up you guys need to get into Europe and do something quickly even if it means picking up league cups here and there or maybe an FA cup or whatever mm. it helps massively because it's not the top four anymore it's like the top seven at the moment so if you go napping for a year or two you will get caught out and yeah. that's it so I still think Chelsea are in a better position, mm. but I wouldn't rest on your laurels, even though the pros and cons clearly show that you're in a better position. Man United sitting uh, about three places above us in the league table at the moment. However, they have lost now five games. Half their games. Yeah, they've lost five games, won five games. No draws in there, which is a bit weird, which sort of shows the sort of side you're getting with Man United at the yeah, moment. They Pretty or nothing. Um, Chelsea obviously lost one less game than Man United. It surprised me when we're speaking about the fact that Chelsea are really struggling for goals at the moment, that we've scored more goals than Man United. We've conceded less goals than Why Man are you United. Surprised? I've read out the stats earlier on. I know, but when I, when I just look at obviously the presence of like maybe a Bruno Fernandes in there, mm -hmm. the fact that with Chelsea... No one else is chipping in with goals. Yeah. With Man United, there's different areas on the pitch. Even if it's a Harry Maguire, a man that was cast out by Ten Hag, coming and popping up with a goal, it's Scott, happening. Scott Johnny Evans Scott popping McTominay. up with a goal. Yeah, you know what I mean? Scott McTominay. Chelsea's goals are literally coming from Raheem Sterling or, or you know, maybe one or two along that front line or it's just not happening for us. Yeah. Nothing from midfield, hardly anything from defence. That's crazy. And that's man. something we really need to turn a corner with. But if we look at this season now, I am not going to give my prediction because I think you can all tell my prediction. I'm going to say Chelsea finish above Man United. Where would you say, come the end of the 38-game season, both teams are at? Who finishes higher at Chelsea and Man United this season? I still say it's a tough one. Do you know why it's tough? It changes weekly because after, you, after the Arsenal draw, I thought to myself, yeah, you know what? Chelsea, that's it. They've turned the corner. Pushing on. Then you lose against Brentford, and the way you do as well, I just think to myself, oh, maybe you're not what I thought you were, like, yet. And I've always said, I reckon you finish six anyway, fifth, sixth this season, maybe seventh. But with United, you just... This week, I'll say United. Mm. It could change by next week, but this week, i say maybe you'll finish seventh. United get six. Do you know why it's such an interesting debate, this one? Because when you look at the style of performances, right... Chelsea have lost games, but I could make a montage from them games where we play some unreal football yeah. and look really, really good. I was yeah. at the game against Brentford. That first 30 first minutes, half. Cole Palmer looked electric. We looked really potent in front of goal. We weren't finishing our chances. We were creating big opportunities, and it looked so fluent. It looked good. We looked cohesive. We looked like a team that could play together at a really high level, but we don't have the sort of... You know, we've got the mental vulnerability maybe where we're not Especially able top, to keep it and carry it out. However, with Man United, I, could, I couldn't really make a montage of them looking good. In a lot of their games, they've looked poor. Burnley, they look poor. Not Wolves, on the Forest. Wolves, Spurs. they look poor. Spurs, they look poor. Arsenal, However, they looked all right, to be fair, against us. Oh, when yeah. I show you some of the results from those games, I can then show you points on the table from Man United. And I can't show you that from Chelsea. So as much as I say about performances, ultimately, performances don't mean anything. It's points that get you up the table. Mm -hmm. So I do think with that, you're going to edge towards Man United ever so slightly. I think it's Chelsea. We're playing them in a couple of weeks' time, so we'll obviously preview this on this show. One thing I want to I want to end on here. We spoke about Cobham earlier on. Mm -hmm. I uh, had a friend, uh, well, I still got a friend, called Dave who's a good friend of my dad's he was head of the fan trust or something like that at Chelsea long long time ago and we were sort of just in Cobham around 2004 2005 
And um, I went to the training ground with him one day. He took me to the training ground and he had a press conference there where, where obviously in his role, being a representative of the fans, he was there. No kids allowed in the press conference. So I couldn't go in. So he had to leave me with someone. He ended up leaving me with a player who was suffering from an injury at that time and I ended up sitting in the canteen and having some food with him. It'd be interesting to see if he remembers this. Joe Cole. No way. Yeah. So why don't we tell them what we've got coming on the Five channel very soon? Well, to be honest with you, I had a chat with you last week on a show and you guys might not know, but I, I really I really like Joey. I like his content and we get on really well and stuff. So it's all organic, right? And when we were speaking last week, you mentioned that you like, Joe, like, oh, Joe Cole, like yeah. you should get him on the channel. I was like, oh, we've got him on fire before, yeah. whatever. So um, went away, managed to get some time with Joe Cole. And then I ring up Joey. I'm like, mate, it's, I, I messaged you first. I said, oh, this one's a bit of an urgent one. Mm -hmm. uh, can you call me back when you get the chance? And you were training or something like yeah, that, yeah. weren't you? And then, um, yeah, he calls back and I'm like, listen, I'm in, I'm not in the gym at this time. I'm in the chicken shop, which I, I shouldn't <laughs> be, but that's where I was. I'm like, boss, can you get me number one, please? Anyway, and I was like, Joey, look, man, um, I've got some time with Joe Cole. Would you like to come and interview him with me? And he was just like, what? No, no way. Of course. So we're trying to sort out a time, whether it be this week, next week, I don't know, really soon, we're going to go see Joe Cole, right? Yeah. And, um, Courtesy of TNT, got to give him a shout out. And uh, the video th the video will be on five, but we'll also put, you're my guy, so we'll put some of it on your channel Appreciate as well. Because that. I just think, bro, you're doing such a great job, mm. you know, and we're all football fans at the end of it, man. So, you know, like, yeah, that's like, that for, to me, that's like getting me time with like Perez or, do you know what I mean? Like, Gilberto, so like these guys that have done like really good stuff for me yeah. at my club, so. All about you know what you know what's funny like I, I obviously i started attending matches towards the end of zola's time at chelsea yeah but i still got to see it in glimpses albeit he was coming in off the bench a lot of the time and yeah. that but the magic that that man had and when he left you sort mm. of thought oh there's not going to be we're not going to see that for a while now yeah. and joe cole was the player oh, that man. came in around that time and literally, like, the things that Zola would do, the low center of gravity, being able to take two, three players out the game with, obviously, you know, he's just he's, he, almost that sort of street football skill that he had yeah. on the ball that you don't maybe see as much in the Premier League today yeah. was something to behold. So I'm really, really looking forward yeah, to... Yeah, uh, I am as well. Like, even though I speak to him a lot, like, if you're, if you, if you're from, like, our generation, mm. and I'm older than you, but... I remember Joe Cole at West Ham. Yeah. Bro, we were all trying to be footballers, innit? And him, Jermaine Defoe, they were like that benchmark where they go, you know what, you can make it if you're, you know, like 18 years old. These are like the young ballers. Mm. And Joe Cole, from those days, with the, I call it the Afro, yeah, like, mm. he <laughs> was just special. Sick, and when yeah. you guys, was it a double sweep that you got that summer with him and Lampard? It was a double sweep, wasn't uh, it? No, no, Lampard came the season before. The season, the season yeah. before. Season you got before. him for eight mil. We, we did get a double swoop. Um, it was him and Glenn Johnson. Madness. Pretty sure it was him and Glenn Johnson. How much did you was... get Joe Cole for? I wouldn't like to be quoted. I think it was around 16 million or something, which at the time was obviously a lot of money. Yeah, that season, but that was worth it. No one could, like, no one better than Ireland, it, though. It was Abramovich's first season, right? It was the, the, the summer transfer window. And literally in that season, we brought in Joe Cole, Damian Duff, Jeremy, Glenn Johnson. Oh, the list goes on. There were so many players that we brought in. Adrian Mutu, Hernan Crespo, oh, Veron. Mutu. Mutu. Yeah. Veron came in the January transfer window, did, didn't he? No, he came start of the season. Really? He, he actually scored um, the, on his debut. A way at Wolves, I think it was. I remember that. When he scored that, I thought, Ooh, yeah, it's going to be a problem, this guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Never worked out. Crazy. Huh? Really, really looking forward to that. And obviously, there'll be plenty of uh, sort of memories from that sort of time to reminisce on. So yeah. I'm massively, massively appreciative for the opportunity there. Um, obviously, wow. the five channel is going to be linked in the description to this video. My Joel's IG. handles are on screen now. So make follow sure us. you head over, you follow him. Message Let us know me. in the comments. Drop me a message. Let's talk in it. Tell me that you've seen the show. I talk back to the audience, man. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. you know, let's chat, man. What's the best thing to catch you on Instagram? Yeah, probably Instagram. Obviously, I'm on Twitter as well and stuff like that. But yeah. I think where you'll catch me the most mm. is probably Instagram. And I, I literally talk to the fans. I banter there. My, I'm, you know, I'm not touchy. It's all bants in mm. it. So, yeah, man, let's stuff. have a chat. And also, make sure you get in the comments with any questions you would like us to ask Joe Cole when we're interviewing him. Get them in the comments and I will see you all in the next one.